staying relevant is going to be about pushing our creativity to its limits. And in some ways that's exciting and empowering because at the moment a lot of creatives reach a point of, I know how to do this, and then they rehash that to make their money for their clients. So I think now's a time where we're really being pushed to, you know, learn again. Hello and welcome to the Luma University podcast. I'm your host, Jean, and in this episode, we get to talk to none other than Fran Flynn. She has a lot of life experience in the visual arts from graphic design all the way through to now innovating in AI technology, which is something we all need to be aware of. So this conversation is extremely fun. I had a really great time getting to know Fran more, and I think you'll get a lot out of it, especially if you're looking into AI generative stuff. So let's go ahead and get started and chat with Fran Flynn. Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Luma University podcast. I am joined today by an amazing friend and guest who I've just recently met on Instagram. This is our first time chatting um, over the web. Uh, her name is Fran Flynn, and she is an incredible uh, personality, but not only that, she has been around the block in the media realm um, in many, many ways. We can get into the details through the conversation, but welcome to the podcast. Thank you for joining me. And I figure we can start out this conversation by asking a bit about who you are, your background, how you got here today. Basically, just let us know who you are. Sure. Well, first of all, thank you so much for inviting me to have a chat with you. Um, it's a pleasure to chat with you and to get to know you further. So I guess I would describe myself as a perpetual creative. So um, even from being very young um, in school years, I was always, art was always my number one interest. And then in my professional career, um, I initially developed an interest in becoming an animator, but that changed over time and I became a graphic designer um, with a specialization in photography. Over the sort of years of my career, I have dabbled in lots of different areas of graphic design and photography and um, combined those skills at different times as well. So yeah, I guess perpetual creative would be the best description. That's fascinating. Perpetual creator. That's a really good way to put it. Like, that's a really unique phrase I've never heard. So I guess kind of piggy-tailing off of that, you have a very unique background in a lot of different fields and animation is actually something, you know, we, we can relate on because I did get into that a little bit as well. But what was it like growing up? Kind of what led you to get into the creative field? Um, you obviously didn't grow up in Australia, which is where you're from now. So how did all that transpire? Um, well, I grew up in Ireland um, and I guess, you know, anything creative was always my driver as I grew up. It was always my core interest and everything I did when I had time to myself related to um, doing creative things. And even um, my first sort of jobs in high school were all creative as well. I actually managed to connect with this family who are all incredible creatives like the I, I connected with them through going to art classes outside of school because the art training in school was really quite poor. So the daughter of the family was the art teacher and they had like, um, you know, a granny flat style building at the back of their property and she had all her art workshops there. And then the mother was a jeweler. The father was um, a woodworker and he used to make little um, sort of wall plaque designs of the shop fronts on old buildings in Ireland. Um, and then the, the art teacher, she also made educational wooden toys. So I was kind of the helper in their family for all their various things. So one day I'd be helping with the jewelry and one day I'd be helping with the woodwork. And um, so that really helped to ground my interest in all things creative. So it wasn't just, um, you know, painting and drawing, it was also anything hands-on. So I've always been really interested in handcraft as well. Um, so there was absolutely no doubt in my mind that when I finished school, I wanted to do something creative. Um, and animation was the thing that I had an initial really strong interest in. And I used to draw caricatures endlessly. I got in trouble at school a lot because I'd get caught drawing teachers. Um, they'd, they'd take my notebooks away and there'd be just pages of teachers drawn in them in a caricatured form. Um, 
And I went to um, a, a uni that had just opened a whole animation sector and it was connected with the Sullivan Bluth um, studios who made a movie called An American Tale. I don't know if you've yeah, ever heard Yeah, I that. love that show. That's so funny because I loved that show growing up. It was my favorite. The, the second one, Five Full Goes West, I watched that mm. all the time. That's hilarious. I love that show. So yes, I am familiar. Well, Sullivan Blute Studios decided they were going to get cheap Irish labor by connecting with universities in Ireland. Um, so the uni that I went to was opened to, uh, well, it was an, a, a uni that was already open, but they opened a new program in animation specifically related to the Sullivan Blute Studios. So I thought this was awesome. I wanted to be a lead animator. I went to the uni. Everything was a bit of a shambles. They weren't properly set up yet. Um, the area I was particularly interested in was computer generated. And then they opened that whole section to a new lot of students because the course was so popular without telling us that would they be taking that part away from our course. Um, and then I also realized that while I'd always been the best in the class at drawing at school, when it came to uni, I wasn't one of the best. And I got it in my head that my chances of becoming a lead animator were low and I didn't want to be an in-between artist or something. And now retrospectively, I realized if I'd worked at it, I could have been a lead animator. But at, at that age, I didn't realize that pure talent wasn't, you know, it that you could actually really work at it and get better. And um, so I just perceived myself to be not good enough to be a lead animator. So my interest in animation as a career waned. Um, and I had seen in the same uni, they had graphic design happening. And um, so that was sort of what ignited my interest in that. But I actually left that uni just because of the level of disorganization. And I got a job working um, in an Apple center in Dublin city and then started studying graphic design on the side. Um, so I was getting all the computer skills um, like in an amazing way because we got to see everything you know, first arrival into the country, um, all the software and hardware. And then um, on the other side, I was learning all the hand um, skills to develop my graphic design ability also. Uh, okay. There's a lot to unpack there for me because <laughs> that's so crazy that uh, there's actually a few things that I can relate to you on here. The big one is you said Apple Center. Do you mean like an Apple store? Yes. Okay. I worked at an Apple store for three and a did half you? years. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I did. Well, mine was a more of a behind the scenes role. I was in the support section. So I um, particularly helped people working in creative industries with support. And then I also was one of the in-house uh, training specialists. So software training. Was that when you moved to Australia? How, how old were you? Maybe I missed that part. Of no, the no, so this was this was in Dublin and okay. Ireland. No, I, I I finished all my university training in Ireland, and I was working in um, design studios by day. So I was actually a senior designer before I started wandering. Um, so yeah, I would have been about twenty five when I first came out, or maybe a little bit younger, maybe twenty three or twenty four when I made my first trip over here. Um, and that was just supposed to be like a six week holiday with a group of friends. Um, but I kept coming back. <laughs> so, um, That's yeah, it, it, I never, I never kind of went right today. I'm moving to Australia and I'm going to live there and have a career there and see you later. Um, I just had itchy feet from, um, living in Ireland and wanted to see the world and went on this first little trip and that ignited a much bigger, uh, interest in travel for me. And then I spent two or three years following the sun um, and I'd stop in places like London and Sydney to work and make as much money as I could as quickly as I could. And then spend, you know, four to six months just having fun traveling and seeing things. So, yeah, Australia, I just kept coming back because the quality of living here is just amazing. And it was quite a stark contrast to how things were in Ireland at the time. So one of the things that we kind of struck uh, a chord together on when we first started chatting was we we found each other on threads, I believe. And I had posted mm -hmm. something about how like the most underrated skill of a photographer, a good photographer is design. And that's when you chimed in and you're like, actually, mm -hmm. I have a background in, in graphic design. So 
um, the, the history that you've gone through is obviously very rich with media, with your, um, that family that you were a part of and helping out and all that, like it all kind of culminated into where you are today. So the transition between kind of graphic design and photography and that being a superpower for you, what is your outlook on that? Because I don't hear it talked about ever, even by high-end professional photographers. The initial part of my career was really focused on graphic design and photography, even though I'd studied it, I retained it as my sort of passion. It was like an, an aside to my job. It was my creative outlet. Um, and I was particularly into travel photography at the time. So, you know, I'd be working as in studios as a graphic designer and then heading off on trips with my camera taking travel images. Um, but in my daily life as a graphic designer, I was continually working with photographers. You know, we'd be coming up with concepts and layouts and handing them to photographers and explaining what we were after. And they didn't always get what you wanted back. <laughs> so that, I suppose, interest in photography was all, always there. And I almost deliberately kept it as a personal thing because I didn't want to pollute it with work. You know, I didn't want it to sort of to sort of lose the passion for it because of work demand because I think a lot of the time well for me personally anyway graphic design can often be um, a place that someone who really wants to be a fine artist goes because they're a bit worried they're not going to make enough money as a fine artist so being a graphic designer is is a creative role but the reality is that you're doing something for someone else and they're paying you so you don't always get to do what you want and often the client who's paying the bill it kind of spoils your design with their feedback and desires, you know. So I didn't want photography to have that um, impact also. I was keeping that as mine and special. I got to a high level in my career. I was working as a creative director. I was earning more money than I could have imagined earning in Ireland. On paper, I'd sort of made it, you know, um, but I felt... Uh, something was missing and uh, there was things happening in my life as well that were making me question a lot of things. Um, so I sort of did something a bit dramatic and went on a, um, a project in Africa. So the project in Af Africa um, was run by an organization called Rally International in the UK. And essentially what they do is they take young people in the UK that are having some challenges in their lives and may not be heading on the right path. And they put them through a program in the UK. And they, as part of the program, they fundraise to come out to um, different locations around the world and participate in a project. Um, so I actually joined this project in Namibia and Africa as a uh, staff member. So my role was part project management and part project photographer. Uh, as part of the project, we built a school. Um, so that was an, a very, um, you know, it turned my mind dramatically and changed my attitude to many things. So when I came back to Sydney to my corporate life, it just felt a bit shallow and lacking. Um, and I took a bit of a hiatus up the coast to a place called Byron Bay, which is quite well known around the world, but it's like a, a tiny surf town on the east coast of Australia, which is known for its sort of alternate culture and a bit of a hippie vibe, although that has changed a bit in the last few years because the you know money has moved in. Um, but it was a really good place at the time to just sort of reset and think and figure things out a bit. And I had a close friend from Sydney living in Byron at the time. So I stayed with her. She was also a graphic designer. And I got a job in a local pub uh, part time. And then I worked in a little marketing agency that my friend was also working in part time. So I basically went from, you know, a a sort of very financially driven life to a very chilled sort of relaxed beachside life. And I focused on, you know, uh, spending time at the beach and doing yoga and uh, developing my photography skills further. My intention in Byron was that there's um, a university in Australia, like the state university called TAFE. Um, they were going to be looking for people to teach graphic design in the Byron area. So I was kind of hanging out for that opportunity to come around. And 
at the same time as I was waiting for that to happen, the owner of the little studio I was working for, he was Canadian. And he said, look, guys, I'm actually going to head back to Canada for about four or five months. I'm going to close the studio while I'm away over the Christmas, New Year period and a bit beyond. And then the TAFE opportunity, it turned out that while I was offered the opportunity, they weren't using any of the Adobe products. They were using like really outdated like Quark Express and PageMaker and, you know, things that nobody was using in the industry that I just felt I can't go in and teach graphic design using software that isn't used in studios. It just didn't align with what my values of how I wanted to teach. So immediately I lost both the things that were financing my, you know, happy beachside lifestyle. Um, and I was kind of a bit at sea about what I was going to do next because I didn't really want to head back to the city. And then just sort of serendipitously, things started to land in my lap. So, you know, one person said, oh, you do graphic design. Can you do a logo for me? And then someone else said, hey, this restaurant in town is looking for someone to, you know, do some design. And oh, actually, the chef needs a portrait done. And I did a really fun portrait with the chef. And it just sort of things evolved. So over a period of about six months, I ended up kind of having a little business that didn't even have a name. Um, and, at, and at one point I went, okay, well, I need to sort of decide what I'm doing here. So I made a decision to sort of jump in both feet. So I kept the job in the bar and reduced the hours I did there as my work in my own business increased. As that occurred, I basically did everything. You know, I did anything that anyone asked me to do, graphic design, photography, whatever. You know, I could kind of offer a full service uh, suite of um, material to anyone who needed them. So that was sort of how I started my business. That's really cool. You had said when you work as a, even a creative director or as a designer um, and even as a photographer for a, an agency or a studio or whoever, you're always building something for someone else, um, which mm. is, I guess, always true in a way. Um, but would you say that the experience you've had in the studio versus your own business kind of starting up by itself, what's your experience with the freedom of creativity and the different environments for working? I think in when you're working in big companies in the corporate sector, um, you're very boxed into their style guides. Um, you know, so any big brand, you know, they have their corporate colors, they have their tone, they have everything really rigidly defined. Um, and unless you're working on, you know, a new campaign, which I had been fortunate to do, you're really, really, um, tightly harnessed into their requirements. And even on new campaigns, you still have to go through all the, we, we used to refer to them as the suits, you know, so the, the client manager and then the brand manager and all the people who weren't creatives that had to have an opinion on the creativity that drive all the creatives crazy, you know? So that sort of experience would be frustrating because some suit would have some awesome idea that would completely destroy your creative vision, but they were oblivious to that, you know? Um, so that that is what sort of sucked the creative life out of um, working in that environment. And at some point, I think you can find yourself just going, well, you know what, I'm not gonna try so hard to fight for my creative concept because they're just going to go with the easy option anyway. Um, or they're going to, they're going to go with the safe option or what fits exactly what they've always done before. So I think that, um, tends to quell your desire to put forward and fight for something new and experimental and exciting. Um, whereas working in small business for yourself, you potentially can have more leeway. There's different kinds of clients. So in the small business world, if you get the kind of clients that are, it's their product, they're quite new to it, they're really attached to it, they really just want a computer monkey to realize their vision. So they're almost worse than the corporate clients because they really don't want to know what you have to say. And often their vision isn't particularly good. <laughs> if you're looking at it from a marketing point of view, it's, it's too much about their personal desires and interests, but they may not be their target audience. And it's very hard to help them separate themselves from their own personal interest and their target audience interest. On the other hand, when you've, well, from my experience, when I was, um, when I built up my business over a period of time, 
and I became known for certain things, people would come to me for those particular things. And if they came to me for my work um, and my creative vision, then they were in a much uh, more comfortable to go, look, this is kind of what I have in mind, but I know you know how to do this, so I'm going to trust you with that. And those are the kind of clients that old creatives want because it's like happy days. They're trusting that I have the ability to do this and they're going to allow me the freedom to do it the best I can. And, you know, sometimes when I'm trying to train new clients, I'll say to them, look, if you have a plumber come into your house, you'll tell him my toilet's broken and it needs some new pipe work. And he'll go, okay, I'll put the pipe work in. You don't stop him and go, hang on, but I think the pipe should go around there and down there. You just let him do his job. And that's, you know, what often you have to encourage new clients to sort of believe in you and trust you because this is your area of expertise that you've spent years developing. Um, but because everyone can have creative vision, regardless of whether they're trained or not, it's hard for clients to separate themselves from that and allow the professional creative to do their thing sometimes. Yeah, no, that's exactly what I was going to, um, or I would say that I agree with entirely in my experiences. When you kind of start out, you feel like you have to serve a very small client and they're very penny pincher and they're super particular and they're like, they want their hand and everything. And you get paid very little mm -hmm. to have very little creative freedom. And it's just, it's not a fun experience. And then you send them the bill. So destroying. <laughs> yeah. And then they want 20 revisions and it's just, it's awful. Mm -hmm. But a lot of people don't realize they can skip that by making, well, obviously you need to be good at what you do, but as long as you're confident in your skills, you can skip to the mid-sized clients that are much easier to work with. And I've, I've discovered in my own personal life that if you work for mid size businesses, meaning maybe they do about a million, two million a year, kind of smaller, mm. but not so small that they're, you know, they have time to, you know, the reason they're hiring you is to fix a problem. And I figured I, mm. I've, in my experience, those have been the best. And I have yet to do like big old worldwide campaigns, but I'm assuming it kind of flips back to where that creative freedom diminishes once again. So there's like this sweet spot yeah. in the middle and you can aim for that right away, which I think is exciting. And everyone should be encouraged that that is possible. And it's actually very attainable. Yeah, no, that's definitely that sort of one to 10 million turnover a year, I think is in my mind, the ideal client because they're progressed enough that they understand business enough that they can have some emotional distance from their business or products, but they're not so big that they've got, you know, 15 people that have to have an opinion on everything that you do. Yeah. Um, so yeah, definitely they, they would be my preference in terms of creative creativity for sure. Right. Yeah, absolutely. And that's definitely a path that if that's what you want to pursue as a solo creator and go just direct a client, I think that's a great uh, viable solution, mm. which is really, really exciting. Um, so I guess this is a photography podcast, so maybe we should kind of dive into that a bit here. <laughs> um, so my question to kind of kick off the photography part of your career and maybe dive into that is you had mentioned that you had a focus on like fashion photography at the beginning um, when you switched mm -hmm. into photography and then it kind of shifted into food and products. So um, once you started kind of more into the photography side of things, what was that journey like um, and how did that evolve again, your creative path? Photography becoming part of my work as opposed to just my pleasure um, came from the little business that I started and basically people coming to me and asking me for things and I just go, yeah, whatever you need. And Byron being a bit of a sort of cool place to go, um, it started to attract a lot of um, other creative industry people around that time. So people like fashion designers um, and a lot of them were even giving the impression that they were living in Sydney or a big city but actually basing themselves more in Byron um, because at the time, now, now it's much more accepted, the concept of remote working, um, but at the time it wasn't really accepted. So they wouldn't be transparent about the fact that they were living in Byron. They might say, oh, we have some production in Byron, but they'd still, from a sales point of view, be based in the city. So um, I just was very lucky to um, be exposed to quite a few brands in the area through, you know, personal connections, like it's a small town. And if you were creatively orientated, you ended up connecting and linking with other creatively orientated people quite quickly, if you were any good. I developed a relationship with a model agency in Brisbane, which is my closest city. 
And, you know, we do portfolio projects where I'd connect a model, hair and makeup artist, um, you know, a clothing stylist, and we do just whatever creative expression that we came up with. So I might have come up with the concept and be inviting the others to join, or maybe the makeup artist would come to me and say, hey, look, I've had this great idea. Would you be keen on doing this? So we're always developing our portfolios and then putting those images out in the world also attracted clients as well. The fashion was definitely the thing that was my biggest driver because I personally felt it was the most creative genre of photography at the time. So that's why it interested me the most. But then on the food side, food is um, notoriously difficult to photograph. And for some reason, I just seem to have an affinity with it. And I can't sort of say why that is. But again, being a small town and it was a beachside tourist town, there was a lot of food businesses there. So you know, and they'd be producing seasonal menus and they needed their food photographed and there wasn't many food photographers in town. So I ended up kind of falling into food photography um, through that as well. So, you know, there's this kind of a theme running here. Nothing was very planned. Everything, <laughs> everything kind of um, naturally flowed and I went with the flow, I guess. Right, right on. That's cool. I, I like, I feel in, in a way, sort of like that's how my career went as well in, in the sense of kind of going with the flow of things you enjoyed and finding people who would pay you for it. Um, but I guess I don't have that knack for food or fashion. Um, so maybe we can dive into that a little bit. If If you have some tips for the people listening and for myself as well, how do you approach a fashion shoot versus a food shoot because they're completely different. And I would say even product photography from food photography is a completely mm. different thing. Um, mm. They're related, but take an entirely different set of skills and styling and prep. And like, I guess for me, can you enlighten me on what you enjoyed and what was difficult about both fashion and food and kind of, I guess, yeah. How, how would you break those two down creatively? I think the first thing you really need to understand about both fashion and food photography is their team sports. So a lot of photography is quite a solo thing, um, but these two genres are very much team-based and um, you're like the director of the team as the photographer. Uh, so you really need to develop quite good um, team management skills. And also I think have confidence in your ability and your vision to be able to convince everyone else in the team that you're on the right track. So if you're not feeling confident about something, it will destroy a shoot. And what brings confidence is preparation. So uh, the other thing I think a lot of people have a misconception about photography is that they think if they're going to be a photographer that they're going to spend a lot of time taking photographs. <laughs> and the reality is that the time you spend taking photographs is actually probably only maybe 20% of your job. Um, and the preparation for a shoot, the liaising with the client, the management of the team, and then obviously the post-production, like all those things and more suck up more of your time. And you need so many skills other than just being a photographer to be successful in a photography business. And I think there's some horrendous statistic, like 85% of photographers fail when they attempt to go out as a business. And I think the main reason for that is that people don't study business skills. And also they have, have an illusion about how much time they'll able to be, be able to spend just being creative and having fun. You know, like you really have to work hard on the stuff that isn't so fun to get the opportunity to do the fun stuff. In the fashion realm, I think my biggest frustration was the fact that it's a really creative realm, but fashion designers are just, if they're small businesses, they're just spread so thin because they're working on two seasons at a time, endlessly ahead of time. They never have enough staff or enough time or enough money. So when it comes to conceptualizing a shoot, which I would like to do weeks in advance so that we have everything prepared and envisioned and ready, they're completely incapable of dedicating that time and their headspace is split in so many directions. They just can't offer that time a lot. You know, I'm grossly generalizing here, but in my experience, this was 
a lot of designers were in this situation. So when you come to shoot day, I like to be really prepared so a vision can be the best it can be. But because of that lack of time that a designer could offer you, it was often not as good as it could have been. And that I found frustrating and disappointing. Mm. Um, And I didn't like that feeling of stress and scramble because things were lacking in clarity that we're trying to sort out at 5.30 a.m. as the makeup artist is doing a model, you know. So I really found doing my own creative fashion work just with a team without a client much more fun. You know, the portfolio work that we would do to get the client work was always much more fun than the actual client work because the pressure felt so high on the client work and the preparation felt low. And then similarly with food photography, well, food photography has its own different areas. You know, you've got things like shooting for restaurants, but then that's completely different to shooting a cookbook, you know? But if you're shooting for a restaurant, again, there was that time pressure and the, you know, the chef being so busy that it's very hard to kind of interact with them in advance and sort of plan out how it's going to flow. So my worst nightmare would be turning up to a venue and arriving in the door and there's 10 dishes sitting on a table with flies buzzing around them and them saying, yeah, right, the food's over there ready for you, you know. And this would be even though I would have said in advance. So, you know, you don't plate anything until we've worked out our rhythm and, you know, the prep can all be done. Like I would have spoken through it often maybe with the restaurant manager who's gone, yeah, 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 and not transmitted any of this information to the chef. They might not have even told the chef they have to do a photo shoot that day. So the chef is not very happy in the first place. And they've just thrown these dishes out of the kitchen And you're like, well, no, we can't use any of this because this is going to look terrible on camera. So those kind of challenges um, were were really big learning curves. Um, I'm making it sound like a terrible job. (laughs) (laughs) I I guess what I'm trying to do is is lift the veil uh, so that people can understand the challenges and pitfalls. Yeah. But at the same time, I do really enjoy my job. <laughs> yeah. Oh, absolutely. I totally know what you mean. Part of the joy of being a photographer is that problem solving, in my opinion. And I don't know what it is about photography in, in particular for me, but I really like problem solving when it comes to lighting, staging, um, even timing. Mm. It can be fun for me. But in other fields that I've been in, you know, that kind of problem solving is always kind of stressful. So I don't know if there's a difference for photography. It's just because it's something that I love and you love love. Um, but would you say that, but you have a lot more experience just in general than me. Would you say that it's the passion for the art that helps you kind of get through those difficulties? I guess there is some sort of adrenaline buzz out of it as well. You know, you really have to think on your feet and come up with, you know, things like unexpectedly, like I'll give you one example. I actually, I do a little bit of video as well. And we were doing a video um, for a client and we'd hired a house and the video was done over two days. And on the second day, the, there was kind of like a main guy um, in the video. He had a car accident on the way to the shoot. Now, he wasn't injured, but his car was totaled and he couldn't come. And we only had this house for two days. And we were going, what are we going to do? We've done half the story on the first day. Like, do we abandon it here? And all that money goes down the drain. And then I, I kind of elbowed the client and I said, did you notice the guy that owns the house actually looks quite similar <laughs> to our actor? He was out in the garden working on the garden. And they were both bold guys. And um, I said, maybe we could persuade him to step in, you know, and he'd been kind of, I think he was kind of hanging around the house because he found what we were doing quite interesting. So um, when we went out and told him the situation and asked him, would he consider stepping in? He was excited about it. So it's those kind of random, unexpected situations that happen all the time. Like that's quite a dramatic one, but that you have to you know, roll with and it's, it's a buzz and there's excitement to, through finding the resolution and making a good job and an outcome. Like there's a story behind each shoot and the challenges that came with it, you know, with fashion photography, you know, you tend to be shooting winter clothes in summer and summer clothes in winter and particularly outdoor shoots and Australia, the elements can be quite challenging 
you know, you've got so many unexpected things to deal with. And then somewhere in the middle of all that, you also have to come up with great lighting and cool poses and amazing looks, you know? So I think the, the adrenaline kick of feeling stressed to the point of, oh my God, I don't know if I can do this. And then by the end of the day going, oh, thank goodness it actually came together and we did a great job. I think that buzz is something that um, is quite compelling aside from the, the creative outlet as well. But you have to be a certain kind of person to, you know, enjoy that repetitively because it's, it's demanding. Yeah, for sure. And I would also say the cool thing about photography is there's so many genres and subgenres and clients and situations mm. that you can find that fit your personality. So for myself, I'm a very laid back, slow, methodical person. I'm very thoughtful and very precise. And so for me, product photography mm -hmm. and still life is, is really beneficial for my soul. The beauty of photography is you do have flexibility to choose the style, the type of product and the niche that you want to serve. And you can find one that kind of matches your pace internally. I think, I don't know. That's just my Absolutely. observation. I think that's, that's, an, that's an awesome observation. And I think, you know, there's some genre, like for example, sports photography is something that I'm not good at. Um, and I think it's, it's all about, you know, that micro second moment that's happening. Whereas I like the planning, like you, you know, the, the methodic, methodical side and the envisaging what may come from your images. I don't find spontaneous photography is a good place for me. So like sports photography or street photography, they're not genres that appeal to me. So yeah, there, there's, there's so many different areas of photography and, and you can move through different areas as well. Like one of the first things I did actually was um, some wedding and portrait photography. So I'd call that like domestic photography when I was building up my business. And like while for some people, wedding photography can be very creative and they can do amazing imagery with, with wedding photography. For me personally, once I'd kind of got the, the process down pat, you know, okay, now it's the bit where they cut the cake. Now it's where they kiss, you know, I was bored by it. I didn't, I didn't feel a creative buzz from it, hmm. but for other people, they love it, you know? So it, it is very much a, a profession that can attract a broad range of different people and interests and also in different times of your life can be, you know, um, different genres can be better. Like for example, when I had my son, fashion photography became unmanageable because of the long hours and demands, but food and product photography were things I could continue because I could do a significant amount in my home studio. Hey, how's it going? I just wanted to jump in in the middle of this conversation real quick to let you know about something that I am very proud of and a lot of people have gotten benefit from, and that is my free Proven Portrait Lighting Techniques e-guide over at lumauniversity.com. Once you get the link, you can refer back to it whenever you want. It's continually updated because it's a web page, not a PDF, which is really great. So everything that I am continuing to develop will be placed in there for your reference in the future. So be sure to check back often and check that out. You'll also get some free lessons sent to you from my latest course, Photography Fastlane, which is all about getting you up to speed on the scientific side of photography and lighting. That way you can focus on the creative side. So definitely head over there right now and get your free portrait lighting guide at lumauniversity.com. And let me say, once you understand light and it's no longer a mystery for you, it unlocks a huge world of possibilities. So definitely head over to lumauniversity.com right now. Go ahead and get your lighting guide and come back to this episode to finish up our conversation with Fran Flynn. You've been posting a lot recently about AI and you've been doing a lot of mm -hmm. AI experiments and AI generated imagery and talking about what could potentially happen in film and photos and for you know commercial work versus editorial, blah, blah, blah. There's so many things. How do you keep up with, after all these years of your career and all the things you have done, how do you find the energy to keep up with all of these major changes and what's driving you to kind of study artificial intelligence and that whole new world? I think like you mentioned yourself a little bit earlier, I'm someone that gets a buzz out of learning. Um, 
And I, I guess I have a bit of a low boredom threshold, so I need to be perpetually learning or I get switched off. One of the things that's a massive driver for me at the moment with AI is actually the awareness that a large proportion of people that I know that work as photographers really aren't across what's coming. And I think this is probably the most significant shift that we are facing in our in my lifespan as a photographer. And I want people to know about this because if they don't, they could potentially be in trouble and not be able to continue their career in this profession. And I think it's that significant. I've always been a bit of a futurist and I've also, which is sort of a bit of a uh, unusual for someone who's creative, I've also been a bit of a tech nerd because both of those things tie in with AI, I guess. Um, and, and plus, I've always liked to have one eye on what's coming. But also, I have a very strong awareness that if you don't evolve, you die. And it was actually, it was actually one of my um, teachers at uni that really taught me um, a lesson that I don't think he intended to. So we had um, a teacher for print technology, and um, he was an old school letterpress print guy. And he, letterpress was gone, you know, but he was so still attached to letterpress and he hated the fact that that had been become obsolete and other forms of printing had taken over. So in our class, he should have been a kind of futurist kind of guy telling us about all these cool, innovative things. But instead, he used our class as an opportunity to whinge about everything that he felt he'd lost and was lacking. Mm -hmm. And essentially what became quite clear was he was just biding. He was, wasn't even like an old man. He would have been in his maybe mid forties, but he had basically decided his professional life as he wanted it to be was over. And he was just biding his time in the teaching realm to pension, you know, until he got his pension. And he was just so miserable. And what he taught me was you can't hang on to the past. You have to move with the flow of what's happening in the world or you'll end up like him. And that was the thing I really didn't want to end up like. So he didn't teach me that much about print technology, but he taught me probably one of the most valuable lessons I learned at the beginning of my career, which is that you always have to be ready to evolve. You can't hang on to things too tightly and you have to have an eye on what's coming next because otherwise you just become obsolete with whatever it is you're attached to that becomes obsolete. Hmm. And I think What's happening with AI is happening incredibly fast, like at a pace that I haven't seen with anything else. And there is an immense lack of awareness in our profession. And if people don't catch on and start learning very quickly, they're going to be in big trouble. And I don't want that for my fellow professionals. So um, that's why I'm sort of, you know, waving the red flag and trying to share what I'm learning as much as I can. Yeah, it's been really fascinating to follow. If you guys have a chance to hop on to Fran's Instagram, you can see some of the posts she's put up about like polls. Okay, which one do you think is AI? Which one do you think is not AI? Or is it a blend of real photography and AI? And honestly, I have a pretty decent understanding, at least I think of what AI is capable of from a still image perspective. And I could not tell most of them. In fact, I was guessing on every single one just because maybe that could be an AI tick or, you know, kind of a key clue of what it could be, but it's incredible just now. And that was weeks ago that technology is getting better weekly and it's crazy how mm. fast it's changing. So from your perspective, as someone who is is trying to educate the world about the AI revolution, or we could call it the era of AI, I guess, what are you seeing that is potentially something people can start adopting right now to help them learn how to implement AI in their business? And what are some things they should look out for that could possibly be dangerous with AI? Um, well, I guess for each genre of photography, things are slightly different. Um, but let's talk about the, the things that are worthwhile and good to be aware of. So first of all, all those mundane tasks that you do repetitively in your business, they could all be automated. You know, a lot of your client liaising stuff, a lot of your, um, you know, uh, admin stuff, um, a lot of your marketing stuff. Like one of the most valuable things you have as a photographer is your time. 
at anything that you're doing repetitively, you don't need to be doing repetitively. You can invest a little bit of time and set up all these systems that will do it for you. And then you get more time to be creative. So from that point of view, um, AI and um, AI tools are fantastic. From an imaging point of view, there's, there's good and bad. So, and also things are really evolving. So where they go is kind of unclear at this point. There is a lot of things that are not going to be available to photograph anymore. So let's take food for an example, right? You've got a chicken shop in a small town somewhere. And previously you got your local photographer in to photograph your chicken and your dishes and whatever. Now you can get someone like, you don't even need a photographer. It could be a graphic designer. It could be, you know, just someone that does social media stuff um, to put together some generic images of chicken that sort of tie in with the style of your chicken. But because you do pretty generic food, nobody's going to kind of go, oh, that's not exactly the chicken I got on my plate. Because people are used to the fact that food photography tends to look a little bit fancier than what people get on their plate anyway. So there's going to be a lot of that where, um, you know, anything like burgers, sushi, fried chicken, all those kind of generic foods, they're not going to need someone to come and photograph their food anymore. And they're going to be able to get a lot of images easily and quickly um, and inexpensively. Social media images as well, there's going to be a lot less of that. Um, the, the thing that is slowing things down at this point is actually integrating real life products into AI imaging. And it's a bit like someone trying to take a f studio photograph of something and then integrating it with a stock image. Um, that it's, you need to be really skilled to make those seamlessly blend. Um, and you see, particularly on Amazon, which is um, where I actually do a lot of product photography for high-end Amazon clients, you see some very bad Photoshop um, integration of products on Amazon. So that kind of issue also exists in terms of uh, integrating a real-world product or item with AI imaging. But I think at some point that will not be a problem. I think at some point AI will be able to interpret an image that it's given and not change it and then integrate that into other images. And when that happens, there's, that's when, you know, the amount of work that we'll be asked to do diminishes dramatically. Mm. So I think to be on the front end of this, knowing how to use AI and to utilize it as a tool in your business is a really valuable thing to learn because even though anyone can type something into an AI interpreter and get an image, the skill lies in getting the image that you visualize and want. If I say to you, there's a little boy standing on the top of a hill holding a red balloon and a red anorak, you will have one image in your mind about how that looks, you know, the, the framing, the depth of field, the environment, the weather, all those little factors all culminate into one kind of image. And I would have potentially a completely different view of that description. So AI is a bit similar in that it takes its own interpretation of a description and spits something out. And 99 times out of 100, it's nowhere near what you had in mind. So to um, corral uh, AI into doing what you want is a skill. And it's quite a, there's quite a decent learning curve in involved in getting it to do what you want. And I think that will continue. So being able to drive AI and also knowing how to incorporate real world images into that AI generated um, imaging is a valuable skill. And I know for a lot of photographers, we want less time on the computer and we can feel quite resistant to, you know, the advent of the robots taking over our work and yada, yada. But at the end of the day, you know, it's here, it's not going anywhere. And you can either be someone that learns and adapts and figures out how you can comfortably bring it into your workflow and be happy with that. Or you can be someone who fights it, resists it, hates it, and then one day finds they've got no work, um, you know, which might sound like a very harsh, stark kind of attitude, but I think in many cases it can be like that. I think a lot of photographers are already seeing a contraction in their work due to, you know, cost of living impacting budgets that clients have. And I think this is 
you know, something they're going to be looking for. They're going to be looking for ways to do things more cheaply. So the impact's going to be fast. We're not talking five years from now. We're talking right now. Yeah, that's scary. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it, it is, is scary. It's, yeah. it, it's, daunt, it's daunting because it's, it's huge, it's new, and it's, you know, understanding what exactly it's going to be and what impact it's going to have on us personally is very intimidating. Yeah. But the more you know, the less scared you are, because the more you know, the more power you have to make decisions about how you can respond to that threat. Yeah, I think to your point, the the skills that are going to be made obsolete are basically, you know, button pushers. So retouchers. Uh, in fact, I have been in contact with Evoto AI. They, they are retouching for portrait uh, company that does really high end retouching work. You don't need retouchers anymore. It's just sliders. You can do bulk, just blast them through and you're done. Um, so that kind of work, just being a technician, a camera technician, just taking the pictures, those jobs are going to go away. But would you say, and I think you had mentioned it before, but would you say that the creative direction side is something mm -hmm. that everyone should be trying to foster and learn, like learn design, learn visual storytelling, learn how to communicate with your client and to affect your audience correctly. Would you say that that is where people should be focusing their skills? So I think the future is unwritten. So all I can share is what I'm personally perceiving, but I might be wrong. <laughs> um, but I think for your, your very tiny client, they're going to try and do this themselves. For the sweet spot client that we've just discussed, I think they will still want a creative driver. They'll still want someone to work with to help create the vision and produce the imagery and manage that process. So I think being a, a, a creative driver or a creative director, an image producer, however you want to describe it, is still going to be very much a profession. And I also think um, building a personal brand is be going, to, going to become even more important um, because that's one thing a robot can't be. They can't be an individual. They can create what they call models within AI, which, you know, have a definition of parameters. So maybe anime is a model, you know, and you can get all your anime style stuff. So that's based on style. But being a human with creativity and a brand around that human is something AI can't be. Mm. So I think focusing on developing your brand and your personal style is really significantly important. Now, you could say, well, AI can then just be uh, instructed to adopt your style, um, which, of course, is a concern, but it's still not you. Mm. And... AI is only adopting and rehashing things that already exist, whereas humans are capable of creating new things or evolving concepts from original concepts into new concepts. So staying relevant is going to be about pushing our creativity to its limits. And in some ways, that's exciting and empowering because at the moment, a lot of creatives reach a point of, I know how to do this. And then they rehash that to make their money for their clients. So I think now's a time where we're really being pushed to, you know, learn again. You know, we need to go back to the drawing board and learn new skills, both in technology and also consider how we can differentiate ourselves in ways that we didn't before. Yeah, no, that's a great great way to put it. I think I couldn't have even thought of a better way to say that, which is uh, really a testament to just the experience you have um, in in, oh, you. <laughs> in the fields that you've been involved with. Um, so I guess just straight off of that, you are um, starting something pretty exciting in education mm -hmm. for this. Uh, what would you say to people who would be a little bit shy or concerned about learning or don't know where to start to make sure that they're ahead of the curve with AI um, or even just to develop skills that if for some reason AI gets completely shut down, which is not going to happen, but if it did, that would still be good for them to learn. Um, so where would you say that uh, people can go to kind of start learning about this and what steps can they take to not become irrelevant here in just a few years? 
Well, this is the other reason that I have sort of, you know, put my hand up and started flying a bit of a flag because I've spent over a year now sort of deep diving into all things AI with a particular focus on my genre of work, which is, you know, photography, commercial photography. And while there's a lot of information out there, it's not necessarily distilled in a way that's designed to suit photographers as such. Um, so to, first of all, figure out even which apps or software are suitable and relevant to you, that, that takes a lot of research and time. And then actually learning them takes a lot of research and time. And, you, you know, there are, for example, if you want to learn mid-journey, there's courses in mid-journey. Lots of people have created them. But I just feel like there was a real gap there for a photographer who owns a business going, okay, I recognize that AI is coming. I need to learn about it. I need to figure out where it fits in my world and for my business and what's important to me. So based on all that, I decided to create um, a course to share with other photographers and I've called it AI for Photographers Survive and Thrive. So we're, by the way, for everyone listening, I always have show notes on lumauniversity.com where the podcast page is just slash podcast. And I've got all of the notes of things we've talked about and links, and this is going to be in there as well. So you can you know check out Fran's uh, uh, course and you can see kind of what it's all about and get an idea of, of what's out there and potentially even kind of get yourself ahead of the curve, which I think I will be doing myself because I'm kind of behind in AI as well. Um, so that's super, super, super exciting. I have so many more questions, um, Fran, for you. And I've like had more come up as we've talked, but the time is running long. So if it's okay with you, um, what we'll do is just hop into the lightning round. And then at the very end, you'll have uh, an opportunity to just let us know kind of uh, any other tidbits that you would like to, to share. But uh, yeah, let's do the lightning round. You ready? I'm ready. Okay, perfect. Uh, who's your Mount Rushmore of artists? Who do you look up to? Uh, now, this is a question that I can't actually answer in a lightning way. Um because I have a little passion, which is graphic art from unknown artists. Oh, um, so every time I go traveling, I tend to try and go to the markets or, um, you know, off the beaten track places and find art by artists in that area. And, you know, obviously they're going in the suitcase, so they have to be small pieces of art. But graphic art is the thing that I love the most. So I kind of collect graphic art from not yet well-known artists. That's my Matt Rushmore of art. That's awesome. I love that. Just off the beaten path, getting inspiration from places normal people mm -hmm. don't look. That's great. Um, are you an early bird or a night owl? Definitely a night owl. <laughs> That's funny. I, I'm kind of a, a night owl myself. And every time I've tried to get up early, it fails. But it's fascinating for people who don't know. Fran's in Australia, obviously, and I'm in the United States. And our time difference is crazy. It's like, what, 10? Yeah. Four, 15, 15 hours. 15 hours. Yeah. So it's, mm -hmm. it's kind of late for me, not super late, 7.30 p.m. And it's what your time about? 11 noon it's like almost 12 30 now okay you can yeah. see the sun's really starting to blaze out there i should pull down the line sorry <laughs> no no it's all good that is funny um if it were up to you i think i know the answer now from our conversation would you prefer a beach vacation or a mountain retreat definitely the beach <laughs> i'm a beach girl all the way yeah that's but i love the mountains too yeah, of course. It's, it's meant to be a bit of a tough question, but it seems that the beach has called you. It's it's part of who you are now. Well, where, where I live, the mountains are just there as well. So you get the best of both worlds. Oh, that's amazing. That's really cool. Mm. Uh, if you had to choose, you choose cats, dogs, or neither? <laughs> I'm actually allergic to anything with fur or feathers, so neither. <laughs> <laughs> I, I threw neither in there because I wasn't sure. Um, if For food, yeah. would you choose sweet or savory? Sweet. Chocoholic. Okay. All right. Uh, favorite season of the year? Um, in Australia, probably spring because it's not too hot, but it's lovely. Gotcha. What about in Ireland? Mm, I would say autumn because well, the weather in Ireland is pretty much hopeless year round, <laughs> but autumn is the season that I think you have the best chance of a few days that aren't 
miserable. <laughs> and they happen at the same time, uh, in the same moment in time, right? The spring in Australia is at the same time as fall in or autumn in Ireland. Yeah, we're on the exact opposite. So when it's winter there, it's summer here. Yeah, and vice versa. it's it's dead winter mm. here right now. So you must be enjoying the nice sun rays. <laughs> Yes, it's mid 30. Well, that's what we're in in Celsius rather than Fahrenheit. It's around 100 degrees most days here at the moment. I've got the aircon on in the background here. That's funny. Um, How do you unwind Mm. after a long day? Um, Well, I'm a parent. So, you know, after a long day of work, I'm on to parenting. So my, my idea of unwinding is a bit different to what it might have been when I wasn't a parent. And so spending time with my family is unwinding. That's awesome. Um, If you had to choose a favorite movie or series of all time, what would it be? I think my favorite movie of all time is The Matrix. Cool. Mm. Short and sweet. I love it. (laughs) Uh, (laughs) Top two color combination that makes you smile. I'm really attracted to soft shades of green, you know, like your sort of sages and soft mint, those kind of tones. And I, it has crept into my branding and into my home and into what I wear and also blues as well. Soft blues. Soft blues so, yeah, and soft greens. Yeah. And I, I guess that kind of ties in with the sort of environment I like to live in as well. Yeah, absolutely. That's pretty fun. Uh, do you have any hidden talents? Um, well, I've done a carpentry course and I do... Um, renovations in our house. So for example, the floor here, I, I laid that floor and um, pulled off all those um, skirting boards and laid the floor and put the skirts back on, that kind of thing. Oh, wow, that's unexpected. That was, yeah. I was not expecting that. <laughs> my, my dad's actually a carpenter, has been a contractor since before I was born. So that's really, fascinating. yeah, that's pretty fun. I actually helped him put in a floor at a lady's house earlier this year. So we kind of have that in common, yeah, right. <laughs> which is there interesting. You go. Another, another overlap. Yeah. yeah you know, like, I guess it kind of ties into, you know, I always love hands-on stuff as well. So even though most of my professional life has been digitally orientated or with cameras and computers um i love making things with my hands yeah so carpentry is a really nice outlet for that i i really think there's something to that um because when i came from i worked at a company called school of motion and we did a ton of animation stuff and it was all in computer and there was no real crossover to the real world like set design and what i love about photography Mm. is that the diy stuff uh, can mm-hmm. really be beneficial. I've built my own studio boxes, backgrounds, and it's ex- way cheaper and mm-hmm. it's satisfying. It's custom, it's high end. I love yeah. that. So it's interesting that there's that crossover with photographers, I think. Yeah, actually, would, that's one thing that it would be nice to have the higher ticket clients for is the budget to actually make elaborate sets and spend all that time creating. I mean, like you, I make, you know, backgrounds and props and things, but, you know, to really do something fantastical and spend a couple of days putting a set together, that would be cool. Yeah, that would be fun. Maybe we'll, we'll do a workshop someday. That'd be cool. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, if you could travel back in history to any moment and photograph it, what would it be? I don't know if it's a moment in history as such, but the time in history that I romanticize the most would be the 60s. Mm. I love, you know, the the fashion and the music and the, I guess, the visuals of that era are appealing to me. Um, so, yeah, that would probably be the time. And probably, you know, 60s into 70s, sort of Andy Warhol-ish time when creativity was really kind of vibrant and exciting and different and new, that that genre. That would be really cool to see. Um, yeah. I'd, I'd like to be there with my camera. Yeah. <laughs> would you like to be there with a modern like mirrorless camera digital and come back and develop it that way? Or would you prefer to have the camera of the times? Oof. Mm, I think cause I'm now so used to working with digital, it would be hard to go back to film because you don't get to shoot 500 frames until you get the one you like. <laughs> um, that that um, I always found, because when I studied, we shot with film. I always found it such a letdown when you had this vision that you'd created something amazing and then you'd get your, you know, prints out of the lab and they'd be a disappointment. Um, 
So I do like the fact that you get to check and reshoot if you haven't got what you wanted with digital. Yeah, it'd be really cool to come back with like a 100 megapixel image of some famous person who's no longer here. It'd be pretty cool. <laughs> it'd be an exclusive thing. But, but to have the skill to create the kind of images that came out of that era with film would be really nice too. Yeah, that's true. That is pretty fun. You have to get your light meter out again. <laughs> Yes, I actually have one. Oh, do you? I've never owned one. I've never <laughs> needed <think>. one. <laughs> yeah, I have one. <laughs> That's pretty fun. Um, cool. So to wrap up everything, I guess the final question I have is, what is the one piece of advice you would give to aspiring photographers and artists who admire your work that you know you would give them to kind of follow your footsteps or to even you know carry the torch on? Well, I don't know if they necessarily have to be into my work, but <laughs> I think the thing that for me has been the thing that has helped me to stay in business as a photographer for so long is never giving up and being relentlessly tenacious. And if something's not working, see what else there is that can work that's in your area of interest. I think you know, people come into this industry because they have a passion for something creative and that can get knocked out of you quite easily when you're, you know, trying to find enough work or dealing with difficult people or the million things that can, you know, spoil your passion. And I think taking a little bit of time out and refreshing and then never giving up, just keep going, keep going you eventually get to where you hope to be. Or even if it's not where you hope to be, it'll be somewhere else that may be equally as good or better. Yeah, I love that. I think one thing that I've, I, I, I think I've known this, but never really thought about it until now or until this last few months recently in my life has been that it really doesn't matter what you choose to do in life necessarily, because as long as it's something mm -hmm. you are somewhat passionate about as soon as you get good at something, that's when you start to love it and you may not like it at first. Mm. And if you, that pushes you along a different path, eventually you'll find something that you stick with long enough that you do start to get good at and you do enjoy. And then suddenly you love it because you're really good at it. So it's funny you say that because something I've discovered as a photographer is that every time I get to a point, I still think I'm not that good. And yet I look back on how I was and realize how much better I am, but I still never perceive myself to be that good because there's always someone better or something better that I've seen that I haven't yet figured out how to do. So, and I think that's part of what keeps my interest in this genre of work because there's always somewhere else to go with it. Awesome. Well, I think that is about enough to wrap up. My brain is completely filled to the brim and I think all the listeners are as well. Um, thank you so much for taking the time to uh, sit with me and, and chat with me about your past and your, your expertise and just all the wisdom you have to share. I feel like we'll have to do this again sometime pretty soon uh, just mm. to kind of get everything out because I feel like we're we're just scratching the surface on the things we can talk about. But at this time, I'd just like to uh, let you speak about what the, what you've been up to, what you'd like people to check out, kind of just let them know uh, where you would like them to go and kind of see what they can be involved with as you continue to pursue your passion of teaching. Sure. Well, um, aside from my AI course that's um, actually going to be released on the 29th of February, I've also put together a suite of other education that I'm going to be releasing this year. So I've got um, an intro to styling for food and product photography. Um, I've also got portfolio assessments which is now available. So I think one of the things that I found difficult as a photographer was evaluating my own work um, objectively and choosing what's good to put in my folio. Um, so I've got a folio assessment option there as well. And then um, in a couple of months time, I'm also opening a, a new group um, mentoring course. Um, so I think a lot of people really find it hard to work on their own business without having a mentor. And that was something that I always wanted. And I found it hard to find some someone that I really connected with and felt like they understood my industry and my challenges. Um, so yeah, I've got a, a group mentoring program that will be part online course and part live chats as well. 
And then um, people that are involved in that also have the option to upgrade for a bit of one-on-one -on -one time with me as well. So there's quite a few um, new things happening this year. And you can find them all um, on my new website address, Studio FF, and that's spelt E-F-E-F, -E -F, Studio FF. Dot com, um, and also through my Instagram, which is just Fran underscore Flynn. Awesome. Well, I'm definitely going to be looking into those myself. <laughs> and I would mm -hmm. highly recommend everyone who uh, is looking for a mentorship from someone who's been around the block and done just about everything you can think of in the marketing side of things. Um, you should definitely check out Fran's stuff. So uh, awesome. Well, thank you for joining me, Fran. Thank you for this conversation. I hope to chat with you again soon and uh, bring you back on. But I've just really enjoyed this time. And I can't thank you enough for taking your time to, to chat with me. No, I've really enjoyed talking with you too. And it's interesting. We seem to have a lot of parallels and I'm quite keen to learn more about you because it's been all about me on this chat. So um, yeah. yeah, I look forward to chatting with you again too. Yeah, no worries. Sounds like a plan. We'll, we'll talk soon and continue on that conversation. Lovely. Thank you very much. Well, I hope you enjoyed that conversation with Fran. My brain is still swimming and I've been editing this podcast for a couple of days now. So I've had time to digest it and I still think I need to have a bit of more of a conversation with her in the future. Before I let you go, I just wanted to remind you to snag your free portrait lighting guide at lumauniversity.com. It's got all the information that you need to start lighting like a pro if you're lighting in the studio. And it also applies to natural lighting. That's one great thing about learning light is once you understand the physics and properties of it, you can apply it to any creative project. So I highly recommend you check that out again, lumauniversity.com. If you have any questions, just shoot me a DM on Instagram at Jean Lafitte, and I am excited to see what you will do. So thank you so much for checking in and thank you to Fran for being an amazing guest on this podcast. I look forward to seeing you in the next one. Take care.